This is Drummer Nation. I'm here today in the Tampa, Florida area, where it's my privilege to talk and hang with the wonderful Marty Morrell. Hey man, how good to see you, Michael. It's been a while. How you yes, been? Yes, I've been good. Been excellent. I've been a fan of yours since I was uh, a kid in college. One of the first records I ever heard when I got to, I went to University of North Texas. The first thing they laid on me there from my friends was Montro 2 with Bill Evans. Oh yes, yes, I remember it well. Which I still right. love. Right. But let's go back before that. Okay. Where are you from? Uh, I was born in New York, raised in New York. And started gigging at an early I age? I started gigging, uh, I think my first gig was um, I don't know, 13 years old or something like that. And who were your guys coming up that you were, you were listening to? Uh, well, in the early days, I mean, uh, you know, um, uh, Gene Krupa and then Buddy Rich and, uh, you know, those, those, those cats, like the virtuosos of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably the end of the, that era, you know, in mm -hmm. 50s, like uh, late 50s. So mid '60s, you were kind of hitting your stride. Yeah, mid '60s. Uh, I had, you know, I was in college, and then I, I met some, some other drummers, and uh, one guy in particular, Alan Schwartzberg, and he and I became good buddies. Uh, and he was all about Max Roach and Elvin Jones and, and Philly Joe Jones, and so I was introduced to all of that, you know. Although my last year in high school, um, bass player introduced me to the Bill Evans Trio. Okay. And uh, um, he played me Portrait and Jazz. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, it, that changed my life because I was absolutely blown away. I said, wow, this is incredible music. Well, that's you know? what I wanted to t discuss. How was that different than the music you, of the late 50s? Well, late 50s, you know, I was kind of playing uh, uh, shows, you know, like uh, in the Casca Mountains. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, I was doing uh, gigs, you know, uh, I wasn't doing a lot of jazz, although I did play with Mary McPartland, and I played with Steve Kuhn and Zoot Sims. Oh, yeah. And Al Cohn and Zoot Sims. And, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a, like a swinging style, like straight ahead. And long. stylistically, by the mid-60s, things had changed. Yeah, it's a, yeah absolutely. And, and how, was, how would you describe those stylistic differences? Well, as you know, um, the early Bill Evans trios Right, were uh, well, the actually the original one, but Scott Fowler and Paul Motion, um, they created this new rhythm section concept of, of interplay where um, uh, each, each musician had their own voice, uh, melodically and rhythmically, right? They weren't just like chugging along and like, keeping time, right? And that was kind of the beginning of uh, the new modern rhythm section as we know it today. Uh, I believe that. I, mean, you know. I think so. It's often cited along with John Coltrane Quartet of the day and the Miles Davis mid-60s mm -hmm. quintet as being the harbinger of what was to come right. with regard to freeing up the limbs and not playing uh, just strictly a supportive role but much more interacting. Right, interacting with one another. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's an interplay. That, that's, uh, mm -hmm. It became more of a conversation within the rhythm section, rather than just like a, a, a functionary machine right. that, that would, would right. you know, support the band. Right. And is that something you were heading towards anyway, or did you make a big adjustment to what you No, I, I didn't make a big adjustment. Um, when I uh, first played with Bill, you know, I had listened to all his records, and uh, you know, I was a huge fan. Mm -hmm. And I admired uh, Paul, Paul Modian. Paul Motion. Back then we used to say Paul Motion or Paul Modian. I'm, I'm not sure which is correct. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. But, but uh, I, I, you know, I just love that trio. And uh, uh, so uh, the natural thing to do was, what, you know, when I had a chance to play with Bill, was to try to emulate Paul Motion. Right? So um, that's what I did. And, and we tried to just kind of fall into that. That was a natural way to play with Bill. I, I thought it, it felt... That was what felt the best, best way. Well, it was a classic trio, yeah. rounded out by Eddie Gomez, who, who was doing similar things on the bass. Right. right. It was all three right. roles were different. Right. We, were, we were just kind of taking, you know, what, what Scott LaFauro started, and Scott LaFauro and uh, Paul Motion, what they started, we, mm -hmm. you know, stayed in that vein and tried to, you know, uh, imitate that and take from that and just take it a few steps further. Yes, you did. And in that day, though, I imagine this is not something that was discussed on the bandstand. 
No, no, never. Um, you know, it was uh, something that was a kind of, uh, you know, you just either you could play that way or, or not, you know. And um, uh, I was fortunate enough to have listened to Bill a lot before and I kind of understood what was required. Mm -hmm. So when I got the opportunity to play with him, I kind of fell in. In fact, the first night at the Vanguard, um, he told me, uh, I said, wow, he says, it sounds like you've been playing with us for a long time. And I said, well, in a way I have, and I've been listening so much. I knew all the material and then the style, and you know, so. Of course, I was nervous, but uh, uh, somehow, you know, Bill made me feel very comfortable. He was just a sweet person, you know, it was nothing, you know, uh, you, you, you couldn't relax with Bill and you had a problem, you know, like mm -hmm. Bill just was, he was just so open and so friendly and, and so kind that that, uh, it, that put me at ease. You know? As opposed to some band leaders that are very tense. Yes. Right. Um, so what years were you with that trio? Well, um, 68 to 74. So any of the kids today who aren't familiar with the Bill Evans trio, the first one, the first grade trio you mentioned, the second grade trio which you were in, or even had another one later in life, need to check out Bill Evans and Mike yeah. Morell. Right. Well. <laughs> Now, after the Bill Evans gig, you, you moved to Canada? Well, I, I uh, settled down in Canada. I was on the road uh, for um, you know, quite some time before that, and my, my ex-wife was uh, Canadian. And um, we had uh, some friends in Toronto, and it was a nice music scene. And um, um, I thought, you know what, let's, I really love this town. Let's, let's come and stay here for maybe about a year, and I wound up staying almost 25 years. In Toronto? In Toronto, yeah. And, and I started what, working a lot. And what kind of work were you doing there? Well, uh, at first, uh, I worked at a jazz club called uh, Bourbon Street, and uh, we were the house rhythm section, and we played for people like Milt Jackson, um, Ornette Kessel, Herb Ellis, uh, Zoot Sims came through, Al Cohen came through, uh, Art Pepper came through, Who's Tom, Tom Harrell, um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was a great gig, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, so you can't beat it. You always had a good rhythm section. So, in fact, I recently discovered a, a recording that I did with, like, that's why you see my old four-track machine there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Tom Harrell, uh, was, uh, the guest artist that week. Great trumpet player. Great trumpet trumpet player, absolutely. He's, he's amazing. And, uh, I think... He was about 25 years old, and I'm talking, this is 1978 to 79, something like that. And um, I hadn't heard of him before, and it was a great rhythm section. It was Bernie Sininsky on piano, great Canadian piano player, and a bass player named Rick Hummy. Unfortunately, Rick passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was a great bass player. And uh, uh, at rehearsal, we all turned to each other and we said, what is this? This guy is amazing. So, I, you know, the next night I brought down my tape recorder and, and recorded, you know. And I finally was able to, after all these years, I was looking at those tapes, saying, man, i got to do something with these mm -hmm. tapes, like, you know. Because I remember being a fantastic week, and uh, um, I, hadn't, I, listened, I hadn't listened to them once since then in all those years. And I thought, one of these days I have to transfer them to some other, you know, to digital source, right? Yeah. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I finally got around to do that, and, and, 
and uh, uh, it was really great to listen to that that stuff. I mean, that was uh, I was thirty five years old or something, you know. And it holds up, right? It, well, it, it's yeah, it's got the kind of different kind of energy happening that you know. But uh, uh, the playing is super. In fact, I'm thinking about I'm trying to going to try to get it released. Yeah. But I think the quality is not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And you were also doing some session work? Yeah, I did I did a lot of session work. That was primarily, once I started doing the studio work, um, that kind of snowballed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, now that's know. a different set of demands altogether, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you had to make adjustments. Well, I had to make adjustments and, you know, play different styles of music. And before I was with Bill, I played a lot of shows and, and stuff like that. And uh, kind of always tried to understand different styles of music. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, growing up in New York, it's like it's all about survival, mm -hmm. you know. So you just want to be able to work here or there, with the, you know, any place you could earn a buck, you know. So um, uh, once I started doing studio work, uh, yeah, I learned there was a different kind of tuning on the drums and different styles, a lot of pop, and that you know that kind of thing. And then I only did a lot of variety TV shows. It was a mixture of big band stuff or country music or mm -hmm. or some harder rock style or. Pop or Latin. What stuff. was the key to being able to cross all those bridges and play them authentically? Just listening, just listening, and you know, just kind of having a feel for it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. as musicians, you know, we're always listening to all kinds of music, and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as a drummer, you listen to what the drums are doing, right? So you know, when you get a, an opportunity to play, that, of course, there's charts for everything, you know, and uh, but most drum parts are are just written in kind of a sketch form, right? where you have to interpret and, and, and play your own thing in that context. A lot of people don't realize drum set parts, people who don't know, so how can you read all those things at once? Well, you're not really. It's a guide, and then you have to, which is equally hard, or harder, is to improvise. To create the particular feel that's required for that. Yeah. that and the part, that, and catch all yeah. the styles, and, yeah. and catch all the mm -hmm. fills and hits, and, right. and whatever the band calls. Absolutely. The, the more I did that, the better I got at it. You know, mm -hmm. I started you know, working almost every day, you know. Uh, but along with that, I did a lot of percussion uh, work as well. I, was, I studied mallets at, at Manhattan School of Music and at Juilliard. So, you know, once the word got around that I, I, I played percussion, I got hired to play studio dates on percussion. So I played when you say percussion, you mean mostly mallets? Or, mallets, or, uh, congas, timpani, oh, yeah. uh, the whole thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. And you're a piano player too, right? Well, I wouldn't call You wouldn't call yourself a piano, piano player, but you play piano. I, I, that was my first instrument. But uh, I've always loved um, playing the piano. I've always uh, been uh, uh, trying to you know, learn about harmony, and, and mm -hmm. I started working with Bill. I love the sounds he gets out of the instrument, and I've always explored and practiced and tried to find you know some of those sounds, you know, and and uh, learn tunes and and uh, you know, and it's a it's a beautiful thing. I would imagine anyone who worked with Bill would, if they had any uh, affinity for the piano, would gravitate towards that in a similar way that uh, many musicians who worked with Elvin would end up playing a little drums. Yeah, yeah. That, Some of that's got to get in yeah, your soul. Well, I, I think, you know, uh, all musicians uh, should play some piano. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a, it's a good thing for everybody, horn players, mm -hmm. drummers, um, uh, and anybody who plays music should understand you know, something about the way uh, uh, chords work and, and uh, structure, you know, and uh, should play a little bit of piano. At UCF, where I teach, and I'm coming into my 10th year. Starting That's University of? Central Florida. Uh, in starting, Orlando? Uh, yes, in Orlando. It's East Orlando. Um, S September is going to be the beginning of my 10th year. And, yeah, I can't believe it's been, been that, you know, that long, but uh, that's a beautiful thing. And, and all our students, our, the drum students, are required to play piano. I work on them for the ear training, and uh, for the jury exams, they have to know certain tunes. They have to know uh, at least to play with third, thirds and sevenths and the melody. Mm -hmm. and they have to know how to play it in at least three keys. Uh, so we emphasize that uh, at, in our program. I, I think it's really a good thing. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Drummers, drummers should learn that, should understand how that works. Well, picking up where you, you left Toronto, eventually you landed on Broadway, right? Yes, yes. Tell uh, us about that. Well, I, I started the, you know, the Broadway thing um, up in Canada because uh, uh, I found that I was working in a jazz club, uh, and then I'd get home at 2, 3 in the morning, then I'd have to get up for an early session, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, I was called to do a, a chorus line, and that was one of my first shows. 
in Toronto, right? So uh, I started doing the theater thing, and I really enjoyed it. It was great, and I could be home by 11 o'clock, and, and the money was better. And what I like about it. theater gigs is when you play the bows, you turn off the stand light, and you stand up and go home. You stand up and go home. You don't have and to pack up. Yeah, they don't have to pack up. You can go out and hear some music right. somewhere, you know? So um, uh, I started to gravitate, you know, with a family, I started to gravitate towards, um, you know, those kind of gigs, you know? So, um, uh, and uh, the late, uh, let's see, late 80s, uh, I started doing a Phantom of the Opera. So I did Phantom of the Opera in, in Canada. And the uh, producer, uh, Garth Drabinsky, right, he, uh, he uh, created Ragtime, the show Ragtime. It was mm -hmm. on Broadway. And we premiered it in Canada, in Toronto. I think it was 1997, 98, something like that. And uh, it was coming to Broadway, and they asked me if I would do Broadway. And I thought, you know, I never played Broadway. So I thought, yeah, I would do that. So when I was coming to, to Broadway. Back and, home uh, to New York. Back home to New York, that's right. And then uh, moved lock, stock, and barrel, stole my house, sold my house, and mm -hmm. backed up. And, How long was that run? Well, it, it ran for two years on Broadway. And... Uh, um, then I, I picked up a few other shows. I did uh, Kiss Me, but, Kate. But, but Hans, I want to ask you about that. Sure. As a jazz drummer, where, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, was it Dizzy famously said, uh, we never play anything the same way once? <laughs> right. Uh, in, right. Uh, if you yeah. do a Broadway sit-down for two years, that's a different mindset altogether it's than improvising mindset. every night. It's a different mindset, absolutely. But it's again, it's, it's about survival. You know, we... we if you have the ability to do it and it's there, then why not? You know, I mean, it's it, it, I, you take care of my family and you know, a mortgage and stuff like that. Well, it's not a criticism, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so uh, it's 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 just it's just a, it's just an, an attitude. You just have to change your attitude and, and approach it that way. You know, uh, mm -hmm. and that's that's. Uh, I'm thankful, like you know, that 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 uh, all that was there and then I could, I could uh, have had the opportunity to be able to, to do that. You know, it, it was, it was great. It was uh, a lot of fun and uh, I always, always learned a lot and uh, it was great to be able to earn a living doing what you love to do, you know.